All right, everybody, welcome to Chapter 6, Static Routing. All right, in this chapter, we're going to cover um, static routes, you know, what they are, when to use them, um, how to configure them. We're going to talk a little bit about classless Internet domain routing and VLSM, uh, summary routes and floating static routes, uh, and then troubleshooting issues. All right, so the first thing is a router can learn about remote networks in two ways. Um, either you manually put them in, or you configure a dynamic routing protocol so that he can learn those automatically. So that's the only two ways. So remember, a router only learns all routes three ways. Either obviously it's directly connected, so when the router first boots up, the router knows what's directly connected only. Then you can put routes in manually, or you can put a dynamic routing protocol on and have all the routers talk to each other dynamically. Alright, so why do we use static routing? Well, static routing has a few advantages. One, static routes are not advertised over the network. You know, when you type in a static route, the static route's in there, and your router does not share that information with anybody else. Um, obviously, so that's better for security. If you have a protocol like OSPF in place, where all the routers build a complete topology map, if somebody gets a hold of your router or access to a router, you know, they actually obviously get hold of a map of their entire network. All right, static routes use less, ba less, I'm sorry, less bandwidth than dynamic routing protocols. Um, the CPU doesn't have to calculate uh, new routes and things and communicate new routes, so less bandwidth is used. And then um, a static route uses a known path, so you know the path your data is going. With a dynamic routing protocol, um, you don't know wh what it's going to pick is the best path, um, uh, unless you configure that manually. All right, disadvantages. Obviously, the initial configuration and maintenance uh, is time consuming. You know, when you put in the static routes, let's say you've got four routers and you need to, uh, like in a square, and you need to put static routes. Each router needs a path to each of the other routers. So each router needs three static routes. So if you have four routers, uh, they would each need three. So you would need 12, you would need to configure 12 static routes. And then if something changes, for some reason an IP address changes, you would have to go back and then change 12 static routes. So it's, it's obviously a little bit time consuming. Um, obviously the configuration is uh, error prone. I mean, you know, everybody fat fingers something, um, especially if you're in like a large network. Um, anytime routing information needs to be changed, the administrator has to do it. Uh, it doesn't work very well with a large network or actually even a medium network. Um, so you get the idea. So we don't use it a whole lot. So when do we use it? Well, if we're in a very small network that's not expected to grow, or if we're routing to and from a stub network, and I'll show you an example of a stub network here uh, in just a minute. Uh, and then uh, if you just want to, if you are creating a path to, I guess if your router only has one way to go, that would be another option. So let me kind of explain that. So in this slide here, um, R1. So R1 is a stub network. In other words, he doesn't connect to any other routers on his other side. He only connects to one router. So he's a stub. So it doesn't matter where he's sending to. If it's not on his local attached network, he knows he has to send it to R2 to go to the rest of the place or to all the other destinations. So in that case, you could put a, a default route or I'm sorry, a static route on R1 to get to the headquarters and get to the rest of the um, other networks that are at headquarters. So, or if that was um, just a small network and you only connected to the internet, you could do a default static route that we'll talk about here in just a minute. So, default static route. A default static route is sometimes called a quad zero. And what happens, a default static route is placed at the bottom of the routing table and it catches everything. So basically, if all the, if there's no route in the routing table for it to go, it then catches the default route because the default route says, "Hey, nothing has to match, um, and I'll work with you." So going back to this example here, let's say this is the internet. So you've got a very small facility; you only have one router, uh, and then you go out to Time Warner Cable or whoever your ISP is. If the traffic coming from the PCs going to the router is not destined for this network, 170, the local network your router then has to forward it to the ISP. So putting one default route of all zeros saying, hey, if it matches all zeros, then send it to R2. That way you only have to have one route extra um, to send all that traffic to the ISP. So that's where the, the default route comes into play. 
So remember, when you're when a packet comes in, it goes through the entire routing table. Default routes are placed at the bottom of the the routing table, and that way, like if a packet came in for destined for 172.16.3, your router would 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 match that first in this routing table. And then if it didn't match, if something was coming for 192.168, it would then match this at the bottom, and then it would be forwarded out to the ISP. So that's how default static routes work. Uh, and we still use those typically. All right, this is a, a summary static route. Now, basically, this from R1's perspective, it doesn't matter whether he's sending to any one of these four other networks. If he's going to send to any of those, he has to send to this router here. So I can either have four, route, four routes in my routing table, or I could have one single route. So basically what you do is you just take these numbers, 20, 21, 22, and 23, and you convert them into binary, and then you find out which numbers match. So in this case, 17220, all of these would have 17220, 17220, 17220, that kind of, and then so only the first 14 bits match of all four of these, so then you can have one route. Now we'll do this in class, so make sure you guys bring this up um, and have me do an example of some st uh, summary routes. Uh, because it will be on the exam. All right, and don't forget in the labs, you know, we typically have very small networks. But out in the real world, you know, if you go work for a Timken, a Diebold, a Time Warner Cable, AT&T, um, you know, their routing tables would be huge. So remember, in order to do uh, to when a packet comes in, it searches the entire routing table, even if the very first entry in the routing table is a perfect match, it still goes through the entire routing table. So one of our jobs as network engineers is to make the routing table as small as possible to make those lookups occur as fast as possible. All right, a floating static route. These are kind of neat. So if for some reason you're concerned that, the, I don't know, something's going to go down or something, um, like EIG or PR, OSPF or, or, or a WAN link, you can put in what they call a floating, uh, a floating static route. So a floating static route is like a backup route. Um, so in case the primary protocol goes down, um, it can then uh, um, forward data. So like in this case, I've got two paths to get somewhere. Um, I've got a private WAN and then I've got the internet. So let's say my private WAN is very fast. Uh, you know, it's all gigabit. But then my ISP stuff is, you know, like a T1, so it's only 1.5 megabits. So obviously this would be a slower path. Well. My, with EIGRP, it's all set up for this path, so that's the primary. But then I can put in a floating static route to say go here. Now what a floating static route is, it's a static route where you change the administrative distance. Remember, by default, all static routes have an administrative distance of 1. Remember, connected is 0, static routes are 1, um, EIGRP is 90, OSPF is 110, and then RIF is 20, or sorry, 120. So what you do is you just put the normal static route in followed by a new administrative distance number and that way it's not always like the the administra it doesn't always take precedence over EIGRP or something like that. So like in this case here let's say I'm using EIGRP to go this way. So EIGRP has an administrative distance of 90. And then I put a static route here that does an administrative distance of 91. Well, when this route goes down for some reason, then the static route would be used, or I'm sorry, the floating static route. So a floating static route is a static route where you change the administrative distance. They're typically used um, as backup routes um, in case something goes down. All right, so to make a, a static route, the command from global mode is just IP space route space the network you're going to space the subnet mask followed by either the IP address of the next hop or the exit interface. Now there's uh, a reason to use one over the other and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But um, the next hop can be an IP address, uh, it can be an exit interface, so you can end it with either of those um, options. So it looks like this. Oops, sorry, it does not look like that. <laughs> Give me a sec. All right, it looks like this. So when you put in your routes, you know, just IP space route space in order to get to 172.16.1.0/255.255.255.0, I would exit out my serial 000 interface. Remember, anytime your router has a name showing, like a, a serial interface or a fast Ethernet interface, something like that, it has a serial or FA. That is your router. Your router knows his interfaces by name.
When there's an IP address, it's typically the next hop, the other router. So in this case, if I'm trying to get to you know this network up here, 172.16.1 from R1, he's going to send to he's going to send the data out his serial 000. So the data is going to come out this hole, which means it has to go to R2, and then R2 is locally connected to that. So that's a static route. IP space route space the target network, or I'm sorry, yeah, the, the network you're trying to get to, space either your exit interface or the next hop IP address. Now we prefer to use the exit interface. And the reason for that is, back to this slide, is the recursive lookup. Basically what happens is, let's say you've got a, let's go back to this. Let's say instead of S000, I put in 192.168.2.2. .2. So basically, when the packet came in destined for 192, or 172.16.1, the route would go through the routing table and say, oh, okay, I found a route for 172.16.1, and it says go out to 172.16.2. Then I'd have to go back to the routing table and do a second lookup for 172.16.2. Then I would find that in the, in the routing table, then I would send the packet out. So if you end your static route with an, a target's IP address, you have to do two lookups, one for the target network, and then one for the next hop address. So again, that's called a recursive lookup. And we typically want to avoid that. So if you end your static routes with uh, interface names, it does not have to do that. There's only one search. Um, plus, you're kind of in more control. You know, if the other guy changes his IP address for any reason or something like that, um, you're kind of covered. Although why he'd ever do that, I have no idea. <laughs> plus, you would know about it because then your router wouldn't work together. All right. So. Configuring a fully specified static route. A fully specified static route is where you put both the exit interface and the next hop IP address. So why you'd want to do that, I have no idea. It just seems like it's a little bit extra work. And I can't even give you, uh, I guess, an example of when you would use that. But as far as your book goes, you know, a fully specified static route has an, a next hop address and um, your exit interface. All right, so how do you verify a static route? Well, ping and trace route are obviously the big ones, and then you can do obviously show IP route to see you know what's in your routing table, show IP route static to see the static networks or static routes that you put in, or show IP route space you know 192.168 the target network that you put in for the static route to show if that static route's in there. So any of those will work. Now, don't forget, static routes are one way. Meaning, just because you put a static route to get to your neighbor does not mean your neighbors put a static route to get back to you. So typically, if you see, um, when, when you do a ping, if you see destination host unreachable, well, um, it means your packet probably did not get there. But if you see request timed out, typically that means your packet got there and did not get back. So there's no return route. So again, now that's just a rule of thumb. That's not set in stone. Um, but that'll give you a kind of a clue of which way to go. All right, so a default static route. IP space route space quad zero space quad zero, meaning nothing has to match space, and then either the next hop IP address or the exit interface. So we typically do that with an exit interface. And again, the default static route is like a little bucket at the bottom of the routing table that catches everything so that no packets are dropped. They're all forwarded out to the next hop. All right, so again, here, for R1's point of view, if anything comes, any packet comes in other than 172.16.3.0, he knows he's got to forward it to R2 because he's got nowhere else to go. So in that case, instead of putting in, you know, a route to here and a route to here and a route to here, R all all R1 has to do is do IP space route um, quad zeros space send to 172.16.2.2. Uh, and then that would send anything that he doesn't know about, which would be anything other than 172.16.3, to R2. And then let R2 handle it. Now R2, because he's got two different paths, he can't really use a default route. But R3 could use a default route. So instead of having, you know, R1 have two routes, and then R3 have two routes, and then R2, so and instead of having six routes in this whole network, you can get by with just four and eliminate two of those. So imagine, you know, what you can do, I guess, on a big network like the internet or something like that. So that's how we do a default route. All right, again, to verify it, you know, show IP route, show IP route static, um, that kind of thing. And then at the bottom, you should see, like, here, right underneath the um, 
legend. Uh, gateway of last resort is blah. And then you should see a static route with the quad zeros in there. Alright, IP6 routing, a little bit different. Remember, IP, IP4 and IP6 are kept separate in the router, uh, and they typically have separate commands. So it's IP route versus IPv6 route. Then after that, the command's the same. The network you're trying to get to, followed by either the address of the next hop or the exit interface. So same thing can be the exit the sorry the next hop IP address or it could be the exit interface and it looks like this. So here again I'm on R1 and remember we're just doing networks you know, we only route to network IDs or subnet IDs depending on, on what how you call those. So with IP6 we only ever need 64 bits of information because the last 64 bits is just host. So in this case, you know, I'm going to academic one, and then this is academic four, and this is academic two, and academic five. So IPv6 route space, in order to get to the two network, I send to 4.2. In order to get to the five network, I send to 4.2. In order to get to the three network, I send to 4.2. So here he's got three static routes that go to here, here, and here. All right, and don't forget, if you're looking at this slide and this looks like gobbledygook to you uh, because you were absent the day we covered IP6, um, make sure you bring it up in class so we can explain that again. All right, so here they do it differently. So same three static routes, only here they're doing an exit interface. So remember, you can do exit interface or next hop. We prefer exit interface uh, because it, it, it only results in one lookup in the routing table, where if you put a next hop IP address, it results in two lookups in the routing table. We want to avoid that. So IPv6, space route, space the target network, space where I send it to. So I'm sending it out my serial hole, my 000 hole. All right, remember, fully specified has the exit interface and the next hop IP address. So IPv6, space route, space, in order to get to the two network, um, I send it out, serial 000 space, and my target is FE80 colon 2, so the target. So exit interface and next hop IP address in a fully specified route. All right, again, you verify the same way. Remember, everything's this, this separate, separate IPv6 and IPv4 routing tables. So show IPv6 route, show IPv6 route static, show IPv6 route, and then space the network that you're looking for. Now, the words ping and trace route still work the same, um, but anything else, like um, if it says show, if it's show IP anything, to see the IP6 version, it's show IPv6 space that version. All right, and then their default route is just IPv6 route space double colon. Remember, double colon means all zeros. So double colon slash zero space the next IP address or the exit interface. So it would look like this, IPv6 space route space match everything space send to 4.2, which would be him right there. All right, again, verifying, you know, show IPv6 route. Um, you should see it in the routing table or show IPv6 route static to show just the static routes. Uh, and again, you typically uh, your quad zero or your default static routes will appear at the bottom of the routing table. You know, the router knows that, hey, that's a default route because it's all zeros, so I'm going to put it at the bottom. All right, changing gears a little bit. Now we're going to talk about um, IP math a little bit more. So remember, in the beginning, when dinosaurs roamed the Earth, they actually assigned out classful IP addresses. So you either got a class A, a class B, or a class C, something like that. So like I think General Electric has um, uh, dot three or three. So any IP address that starts with a three, so three dot something something dot something, uh, is is General Electric. That's kind of how they were selling addresses, but they quickly realized, hey, if we do this, we're going to run out of IP addresses. So before we move on, the, here's the ranges, class A, B, and C, um, and then D and E. So D is the reserved for multicast, um, and then D is reserved, sometimes they call it experimental, things like that. Um, but you have to get government permission for that one. Now, remember, what separates the classes is not the numbers, it's the bits. So they call these the high order bits. It's the very first uh, octet. So if the number, if you convert the IP address, the very first number to binary, if it starts with a zero and then anything, it's a class A IP address. 
So a class A is 1, I'm well actually in this case 0 through 127. Typically when you look at charts it'll always say 1 through 126, but technically 127 is a class A IP address. Now, how come 127 is typically not included? 127 is reserved as a loopback. Your books typically tell you 127.0.0.1. Um, and that's what we use, you know, when we test our NIC card or we test our IP our TCP IP stack. But the entire 127 range is reserved, meaning you can ping 127.anything.anything.anything and your NIC card will respond. So the entire 127 range is reserved for loopback for testing purposes. All right, and then if your first two bits are 10, it's got to be a class B, and that would be 128 through 191. And then if the first three bits are 110, 192 to 223. Um, so you get the idea. So that's how they split it up. So they, whatever uh, your first number, your first octet in the, uh, in the IP address dictates the class. And then whatever um, the binary bits are determines where he fits in that class. So remember, in CCNA, we only cover A, B, and C. All right, so a class A network comes with a default subnet mask of 255000. A class B subnet mask, is, so the default is 255.255.0.0, and a class C is 255.255.255.0. So remember, when you buy a class A, you've got three whole octets to use for host portion, meaning you can have like 16 million uh, different hosts. In a class B, uh, you could have 65,000 hosts, and then a class C, 254 hosts. And then obviously, in order to subnet, we start changing these zeros in the host portion into ones in the subnet mask. So we can have we can start splitting and have more networks and less hosts. So in classful routing, we routed by the the class itself. So we just looked at we didn't even use a subnet mask. We just looked at the class. So in this case here, hey, you know, I would send it to 172.16.1.0. Um, I wouldn't even send a subnet mask. So it worked on smaller networks in the beginning, but it did not <laughs> work on bigger networks um, or as the internet grew. So then they changed to Sitter. So initially, like the class A's took up one half of the IP scheme, and then class B's 25%, class C's 12%. Um, so basically, a lot of addresses were wasted. You know, when General Electric bought 3.0.0.0, um, they probably didn't have 16.7 million hosts on their network. Um, so a lot of addresses were wasted. So we moved away from classful routing protocol, or from classful addressing. And then we started changing the subnet mask. So no longer do we use just a slash 8, a slash 16, or slash 24. We changed the subnet mask. So whenever you change the subnet mask and you're no longer doing slash, you know, just classes, um, you have classless internet domain, or classless internet or interdomain routing, so um, CIDR. So with Sitter, you could change the subnet mask to give you just the amount of hosts that you actually need. So instead of buying an entire Class C because you have a hundred hosts, and then which a Class C would give you 254 usable IP addresses, and you're going to waste, you know, 150 of those, um, you could just change the subnet mask, and you would only be using 126 addresses. All right, so again, so we use classless internet domain routing um, to save addresses and do things more efficiently. And then here's an example of doing a static or a summary route um, with Sitter. So basically, it doesn't matter which of these six networks I go to. I can either do make six static routes or I can make one static route. So if I only have to match 172.16 and I'm only matching the first 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 bits, then all of these match this. So I can either do one route or I can do six routes. Again, if after reading your book you're weak on route summarization, um, make sure you bring it up in class and I will do some examples to make sure you understand this. All right, so now we do classless internet routing protocol. So with classless, we send a subnet mask um, because the subnet mask is not going to be standard. You know, with class full routing, um, it just looked at the IP address. So if it was 172, it knew it was a class B and it automatically assigned a 255.255.0.0. But with classless routing, uh, we can change the subnet mask. So just because it says 172.16 does not mean it's going to get a slash 16 subnet mask. It could have a slash 14. 
All right, with VLSM, we also change the size of the subnet mask. So when we first learn IP math, basically what we do is we split a network up into equal portions. We either split it up into four equal portions or eight equal portions or you know uh, 16 equal portions, something like that. So that's CIDR, C-I-D-R. But with variable length subnet mask, we now change it into unequal portions. Um, you know, we may have a bunch of 30s, and then we must have a bunch of um, with, uh, addresses with just two addresses needed. So the sizes of the pieces of pie are obviously going to be different. So variable length subnet mask allows us to have a different subnet mask for each subnet, so we can save addresses. So imagine you get a headquarters office with 100 users, and then you've got a satellite office with 50 users, then you have a second satellite office with only 20 users. There's no need to give them all a class C IP address. When you can take one class C IP address, and then using VLSM, you can subnet that out. All right, so we'll go over VLSM in class. Because um, you know, once you learn SIDR, uh, classless inter domain routing, and how to split a network up into eight, um, changing it to VLSM is actually pretty easy. All right, you can also subnet a subnet. So basically, you know, let's say somebody says, "Hey, break this subnet into blah." Um, so you've got a whole bunch of different subnets. Um, let's say we broke it up into eight, and then you take one of those slices out of there, and then you break that up into multiple. Um, subnets. So you can actually subnet a subnet. And that's typically used in networks and it looks like this. Most places when they have it at the end they divide the very last portion up into a bunch of small networks that each only um, have two usable hosts. So you get a bunch of slash 30s at the end. And the purpose for that is to allow routing to routers. You know, anytime you've got two routers together um, that connect, you need two usable IP addresses for that connection. So anything else would be a waste. So here, in this case, um, you've got you've got a bunch of buildings and then you've got a bunch of routers between them. Now remember, each building has a network, so there's a network here, network here, network here, network here, and then between routers you have another network. So remember, between routers I only need two usable IP addresses because this has to be a separate network, but there's only going to be two hosts on that network. So here I like to use slash 30s. So slash 27 works and fits most of these, and then a slash 30 fits between routers. So that's where you get a variable link subnet mask. Your subnet mask is different depending on which you know piece of the highway you're on or which piece of the pie you take. All right, so route summarization. Remember, we, we try to take the routing table and make it as small as possible. So we try to um, uh, condense the routes. So here's the way kind of route summarization works. So if I get a, I, let's say my router goes to you know R2, and then on the other side of R2 there's all these different networks. So there's the 20, 21, 22, 23. What you want to do is you want to change, convert that to binary. Now you know 172 is all going to be the same, and you know all the zeros are going to be the same. So in these examples they always convert the whole thing, but you only need to convert the bit that's different. So in this case, 20, 21, 22, 23. This is the place that's different. This is what you need to convert. Once you convert these to binary, so this is 20 in binary, this is 21 in binary, 22 in binary, 23 in binary, then you just got to find which ones of these match. So in this case, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, the first 6 bits match. So if I know 8 plus 6 match, then my, I know my new subnet mass is going to be a slash 14. Then if I add this number up, it comes out to 60, or sorry, 20, because 16 and 4. So if I send something to 172 I'm sorry 172.20.0.0/14 it matches all of those so that's how we do a summary route so again summary routes help us to eliminate the extra routes in the routing table um, again from R3's perspective he needs three networks he needs three routes in his routing table you know uh, one two and three so he can make those three or he can summarize those and say hey out of those three routes these bits match on all three of them, so I can just route to this. So he can route to 172.16.0.0 with a slash 22 subnet mask, and that would match all three of these. Now with IP6, it works the exact same way. Uh, the problem with IP6 is we typically summarize or um, we abbreviate some of the stuff. So here's the steps. Basically, what you have to do is you have to uh, expand the IP6 addresses back, and then see what you can match. So in this case, 
you got R1, and here he has, you know, a, uh, you know, db8.feed, and then he's got a bunch of, you know, academics over here. So these four academics are all the same. You know, they're all 2001, um, db8 space academic space, and then they get different here on the fourth quartet. So what you can do is you can just drop that, and then just IP route space 201 DB8 uh, academic, then then your double colon, and you're only matching 45 bits, and then send it to this target address. So you can summarize IP6 addresses. Uh, and again, typically what we end up doing is we end up dropping this uh, quartet. Remember, with IP6, we have eight quartets. The first four, one, two, three, four, are network, and then the second four are host. Sometimes I've heard them called sec or, I'm sorry, hex tests. All right, so remember, floating static routes, um, you put the administrative distance at the end. And again, floating static routes are typically used for um, backup routes. So in this case, um, R1 makes a static route. So again, they put another link down in here. So R1 makes a static route. So IP route space, hey, if I don't know where to go, go to 172.16.2.2. So go here. But in case this link breaks, he then puts in a floating static route, IP route, blah, 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 and changes the administrative distance to 5. So remember, a static route will always have an administrative distance of 1. So in this case, this, this first static route would always be used. But if that link goes down, then that route is removed from the routing table, then this route takes priority. So it becomes the backup route, then it becomes used, um, and you get the idea. So again, it's just a floating static route is just a static route with a number behind it with the, which gives the static route a new administrative distance. All right, again, to test, um, you can do a couple different things. Um, show IP route to make sure that's in the routing table. You can take the primary down and make sure that you know route stuff goes the other way, um, but you get the idea. All right, so some, some troubleshooting thoughts. Um, one, remember, ping and trace route are your friend. Um, I typically don't use ping as much as, as some guys. Um, I, I'm a trace route fan, or trace. Remember, if you're on the PC, it's trace cert, and if you're on a router, it's trace route. You know, ping just tells you, hey, connectivity's down. But trace route shows you, hey, connectivity's down, and here's where it's down, um, because that's what you need to know. So typically, if you do a ping and it doesn't work, um, you, the next thing you're going to do is a trace route. So you might as well skip the ping command and go right to that. Uh, remember, show IP route. Look at your routing table and see what routes ended up in there. It's so easy to put in a static route and a fat finger one. Um, show IP interface brief. Uh, look at the IP addresses that you put in. You know, look at the protocols and the status. Um, did I leave one administratively down? Stuff like that. And then show CDP neighbors detail. Um, did you put in a next hop IP address? And is that next hop IP address correct? All right, so again, solving a connectivity problem. The first thing I typically do is do a trace route to see where the break is, and then I go to the last router that responded, and I look to see the difference between that router and the next link in the chain. Uh, you know, is it a connectivity issue? Do I have connectivity? Um, is it an IP addressing issue? Do, are they both on the same network? Um, and then is it an EIGRP? Is it a static route issue? Something like that. Now, and again, don't forget, just because you have a static route to get there does not mean they have a static route to get back. Um, especially if you're working with another organization. Um, we used to work with another organization where we had a T1 between us um, and we would put in a static route to go to there, um, especially when they had new networks that came in. And then they would sometimes forget to put one back to us um, because they were a huge place and basically we would call somebody and say, hey, you know, you need to do this and then they would submit a ticket and then would go to another company and go to another department, that kind of thing. But eventually, you know, we would have people working over there, and then they wouldn't be able to connect. And then they would call the other person's help desk, and they would say, oh, well, you're part of Organization A, so you need to call Organization A. So they would call us, and by that time, they're kind of mad because they got the runaround. And then we would do a trace route and see that our stuff got into their network, but then never, it kind of died after that. So we realized that they did not have a return path. So it's, it's great for stuff like that. All right, so that kind of wraps up Chapter 6. Remember, static routes are nice um, for testing purposes, uh, for troubleshooting purposes. You know, let's say you've, you're setting up a dynamic routing protocol like EIGRP or OSPF, um, and for some reason you're like, man, you know, something's not working right. You know, throw static routes in there to check connectivity and things like that. And then, if, and then once you've got connectivity and stuff issues, then you can pull the static routes off. Or if you have very small networks. All right, remember, next hop IP addresses um, are typically, you don't want to use those. You want to do um, your exit interface. 
Um, and remember, st uh, static routes have a admi default administrative distance of one. Remember, floating static routes is just a static route with a different administrative distance at the end. And also, don't forget that you can summarize the static routes so that if you want, instead of having four or five static routes, you can summarize them typically into one static route. All right, let's see what we've got in your folder this week. All right, here's week seven. So if we go to materials, uh, the only extra thing beside the slides, uh, there's a video on uh, Sitter and, and VLSM um, that links here. So again, somebody walks you through that stuff. Um, again, especially the VLSM, um, when you guys come to class for lab day, um, make sure you mention that, um, and I will go over summary routes and VLSM for you. All right, and then if we go to assignments, all right, so again, you got your quiz this week. Um, you've got three labs, um, A and B, I think you guys do at home. Uh, and then lab C is the one that we'll work on together in class. So remember, A and B are, your, are, are labs that you're supposed to do at home. Uh, you do those at home before the actual class, and then when you come in, you know, we have lab 6C. Then after 6C, you know, there's two homework assignments that go in there. So these, these two drop boxes are for the homework only, homework 6A, homework 6A, kind of easy. And then this is the one that we'll do in class, and then you'll drop it here. So A and B are not for grades. Again, they're for practice. Remember, guys, when you're done with this class and you graduate, and you go to get a job. They're going to expect you to know this. You can't walk in there and say, hey, I got a two year degree from Stark State. Oh, that's great. Well, hey, show me how to do a static route. Duh, I don't know how. Pff, guess who's not going to get a job? You. So you got to learn this stuff. Um, you're not just trying to get a grade in class. You've got to understand this material. Take notes, keep your notes, uh, and that way when you graduate and you get ready to start interviewing with these companies, you can refresh yourself on your notes and you can kind of be in there and be ready to answer these technical questions. All right, well, that's enough for this week. Um, I will see you guys in class, and we'll do some IP math. Hooray! All right.